Hello, I'm Hanson Tipton, and I serve on the Knoxville Bar Association Judicial Committee. And today I'm speaking with Dino Cole, who is running for Chancellor of the Knox County Chancery Court, Part 2. Dino has practiced law in Knox County for 25 years and serves a wide variety of clients and cases in a general practice emphasizing litigation, including all cases that come before Chancery Court in areas such as general civil litigation, domestic relations, including divorce, child custody, child support, and orders of protection, business law, construction law, will contests, declaratory, excuse me, declaratory judgment actions, in addition to consumer bankruptcy and criminal defense. Good afternoon, Dino, and thank you for sitting down with me today. We have some questions we'll be asking all of the candidates for the various offices. And the first one for you is, what makes you qualified to serve in this office you're running for? Well, you, you highlighted my 25 years, Hanson, and uh, I've been in full-time private practice that whole time where I've drafted umpteen motions and responses in all state and federal courts. I've conducted countless arguments, jury trials, non-jury trials, appellate brief write, writing that uh, led to wins to the Court of Appeals, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals, Tennessee Supreme Court. I've had published opinions in all those courts, plus published opinions in the bankruptcy court, and even in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is our federal, federal uh, appellate court. I've even drafted uh, writs of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and in, in those 25 years of practice, most judges I've run across are very well versed in the law. And I've, I've seen a few, who, a very few who haven't been, but, but what's really bothered me more than anything is not a judge's grasp of the law, but whether the judge has a, a judicial temperament and how he or she treats the lawyers and the litigants. In many instances, and despite whether or not I, I won or lost the case, if, if a judge acted with disrespect to an attorney or a party, you know, it distressed me because the entire concept of due process requires not only a fair tribunal, but, but one that treats the parties and attorneys with respect. I believe my best strength to hold this office, you know, beyond my knowledge of law and, and practical experiences, I would never treat anyone in the court with disrespect. I've got a lot of patience. It's pretty hard to rattle me. I went through a, a tough year. My first year at the Citadel where I graduated military college in 1993. Uh, I'd also point out that Chantry Court has a docket which is about 40% family law or domestic relations as some people might call it. And my law practice is about 40% of the same types of cases. I've handled every type of case uh, over which Chantry Court has jurisdiction, including even jury trials in Chantry Court, which are pretty rare. And I've had administrative hearings that are appealed to Chantry Court. I'm a Rule 31 listed civil and family law mediator. I've been part of countless mediations and trials and hearings. And uh, I was selected by the, the Tennessee Supreme Court as a hearing officer for the Board of Professional Responsibility. I'm active in the Knoxville Bar Association. I've served on multiple committees in that uh, regard. And I kind of consider myself a law nerd. I, I see the law like a puzzle that uh, when it's solved, it, it, it thrills me to get it right. You know, as far as uh, weaknesses, uh, I'm, I'm a little OCD when I write briefs. You know, I'll search forever to find the perfect case that may contain facts that are almost exactly on point with the, the case I'm researching. And I guess along the same lines, I, I, I work too many hours and I, I sometimes sacrifice my personal time. But I, I will say it benefits the judicial system to have a judge who, who loves the law, who enjoys writing opinions. And that's something I've done as a hearing officer for the, the Board of Professional Responsibility. I've sat as special master before, which, which is hearing order protection cases. And I've also written opinions uh, for the Knoxville Bar Association fee dispute committee. All right, thank you. What do you think have been the most effective methods for improving court procedures and efficiency, either in the chancery courts or the courts in general? That would be electronic access to the dockets and electronic filing. You know, I've been in practice since 1997 and 
starting, I guess, in the early 2000s, uh, I've enjoyed using what's called ECF, electronic case filing in the federal courts. You sit at your desk any time of day or night and file briefs, motions, lawsuits, responses to all those. Um, you can see everything that's on the docket. In the last few years, I've enjoyed the convenience of filing briefs in the Court of Appeals, the Tennessee Supreme Court, um, but you know, electronic filing like it is in federal court is uh, lacking at the state trial level. And I think it would really make a difference uh, like it has in federal court if we had that at the state trial level. And our, you know, I, I guess another way to answer this question too is to talk about how our, our Supreme Court, Tennessee Supreme Court's always tweaking the procedural rules and evidentiary rules. And mostly it's for the better. And I've enjoyed my time on the Knoxville Bar Association Professional Professionalism Committee. Uh, it makes recommendations to the Knoxville Bar Association Board of Governors, uh, who in turn will comment on rule changes to the Supreme Court. And our bar has really helped tweak proposed rules. And they've even gotten the Supreme Court to jettison some of the proposed rules that weren't necessarily in the best interest of justice. And I you know, finally say that courtroom technology allows for a, a better presentation of evidence. And that's something that I'm used to utilizing in both state and federal court and, and hope that it become more, it can become more prevalent in the uh, state courts. And uh, along those same lines, Dino, what additional improvements would you recommend for the future of our judicial system? Well, as, Lawyers, uh, we all expect to be to have a judge who's equipped for the job, and uh, I, I believe that our Supreme Court should consider the merits of uh, perhaps amending the basic requirements and rules to keep inexperienced candidates from entering the race. I believe that the qualifications uh, could be too low to, be, to become a candidate for judge. Uh, the qualifications uh, off the top of my head are 30 years old, having a law license, citizen of your judicial district. And I, I think that might be too basic. Uh, I don't think that a lawyer should be allowed to stand for election to the bench, you know, on the heels of just graduating from law school, even if they are 30 years old. You know, there are states that have a mandatory uh, 10 year and practice minimum requirement before you can run for judge. You know, aside from understanding the rules of procedure and evidence, experience helping clients and understanding people going through the legal process is paramount. Uh, our judicial system deserves some more basic requirements for judges. Uh, and last I checked, there are uh, 34 states have uh, mandatory retirement ages, often said at 70. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a magic number that to require retiring, but it, might be worth exploring. I know it's being explored at the, the federal level. Um, and I think that another way to improve the judicial system would be to authorize the, the Board of Judicial Conduct, which is the arm that overlooks uh, judges' conduct if they misbehave, uh, to have the power to summarily suspend judges if they pose an immediate threat to the public. And finally, I, I think like I touched on earlier, we just need to increase technology in the courts. You know, we live in a transient society. I've had several hearings on Zoom and other platforms during COVID, and we don't. And I don't see why we can't just continue to utilize this technology. You know, attorneys who might not be able to make it to court, or a party who might not able to make it to court because they have a sick child or have other personal reasons, ought to be able to participate from home on Zoom. Uh, this allows cases to keep moving forward and not to be continued. Uh, that's one of the biggest complaints I hear from clients is why does this case keep getting continued? It reduces the clients from having to pay lawyers, having to drive, especially if they hired a lawyer that is having to go out to a different county. And, you know, I also go on record to state that uh, we should get rid of docket soundings. They're, they're a waste of time and they should never be brought back to our judicial district. And they're not prevalent in our judicial district. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dino, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the court? Well, uh, I go back to technology once again. You know, we just need the state trial courts to embrace technology, allow the filing of electro electronic pleadings, uh, accessing, allowing people to access the entire docket electronically, uh, allowing, like I said earlier, to attend motions and hearings on video. 
you know, maybe a silver lining from COVID is that the courts will allow more hearings over, over video since they, they weren't very uh, in, embracing of that concept before COVID. You know, but another downside of COVID is, is going to be catching up on the, the docket backlog. That'll be a challenge. I suspect that the um, cyclical economy that we live in will eventually take a turn for the worse. I'm, I'm not hoping for it, but I'm afraid that it will. And we'll see more people unable to afford an attorney and pro se litigants, you know, those proceeding without a lawyer often don't get justice because the, the courts can't assist them. You know, dealing with pro se litigants will, will also be a challenge. It, it could tax the legal aid society that helps uh, people who don't have means to hire an attorney and will also increase the need for pro bono assistance. But on a, you know, a bigger scale, I, I think we've witnessed Supreme Court nominations becoming more hostile and it's somewhat divided our country even further. Uh, at the public, what the public doesn't generally understand is that at the highest level, those justices are usually in lockstep and they're not divided except on some of the more political type cases. And the, the people who serve at those levels are extremely bright. They have, I think the best of intentions. To them, it's not an us versus them mentality as, as the public might think otherwise. And it's important that the public continues to trust the judicial branch. You know, I don't wanna see a distrust of the Supreme Court uh, translate into a, a general distrust of the trial courts. I, you know, people have to have confidence in their judges, their court systems for it to continue to survive. Certainly. And, and our final question, Dino, who are your judicial role models and why? Well, from a local perspective, I greatly admire Chancellor Weaver. Uh, he's chancellor in Knox County, uh, part one, and he's probably one of the smartest jurists in East Tennessee. He, he cares more about getting it right than just about any judge I've ever dealt with. Uh, he won't blindly sign off on agreements. So make certain that the agreement that's written up by the lawyers is legally and procedurally sound. He takes complex cases that he hears from a trial under advisement, which means he, he goes and thinks about it, reviews his notes, looks at the evidence, and then he'll render written opinions with, with a proper statement of the facts and conclusions of the law before he comes to an ultimate decision. And as a chancellor who primarily hears non-jury trials, you owe it to the lawyers and the parties to give a well-reasoned written opinion, especially in complex cases, and not just shoot from the hip from the bench like I've seen before. I, I would say that another jurist I admire despite what, you, what some people may think of his views is, is Justice Scalia. When I was a law student, I was selected uh, to chaperone Justice Scalia for an entire day. And I'll never forget those intimate one-on-one -on -one conversations I had with him. And I was just blown away about how nice he was to me. I was just a mere law student and he was nice to, to me and everyone he met. And he might've been one of the smartest people I've ever met. And, and I'll just say, that, you know, as a general proposition, the most admirable judges are those who don't play favorites or engage in, you know, what some lawyers call a home cooking. Uh, the judge should understand the law, the procedure, and, and treat everyone who comes in the courtroom with, with kindness and respect. All right, thank you. Now, Dino, we have one minute for a closing statement for you. So uh, let us know what, what you have to say. Thank you, Hanson. I, I appreciate you for volunteering to conduct this interview. It, it's important that lawyers know that judicial candidates, since uh, they'll be responding to the KBA poll that many voters will rely on. And, and this is a, a good chance for the people to hear from the candidates directly that, that are gonna be voting that are not necessarily lawyers. And I'll say that I'm the only candidate 25 years of real world practicing legal experience compared to my opponents who don't have very much litigation experience at all. I've published opinion, I have published opinions in the appellate courts, uh, including the, the Sixth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals and drafted uh, opinions to the U.S. or petitions for cases to be heard in the U.S. Supreme Court. 
I'm the only candidate to argue and win cases uh, starting at the trial level all the way up to the Tennessee Supreme Court. I've handled every type of case that comes in Chantry Court plus more. I'm very active in the Bar Association and in the community where I, I volunteer when I can. You know, I'm not a politician. This doesn't come natural to me. I've never run for political office before. I'm, I'm the right age, I think, at 50 years old. I understand legal issues from a client standpoint. I've participated in countless hearings and trials and mediations. A trial judge without practical legal experience becomes lost in the ivory tower when they're on the bench. They, don't, you know, they won't be able to pick up on nuances like when a litigant or even a lawyer might be gaming the system. If, if you want a lawyer on the bench with the right experience and temperament, please encourage your family, your friends, and your neighbors to vote for me. You know, early voting starts April 13th, and the primary election is on May 3rd, 2022. I appreciate you watching the video, and uh, thank you for learning more about why I'm running for chancellor, and I appreciate your recommendation and your vote. All right. Thank you to Dino Cole for your time this afternoon, and good luck in the election. Thank you, Hanson.